want to share with us this morning is I want all of us to be ready to state your full name. How many of you don't tell anybody your middle name when you introduce yourself? You don't tell your middle name. How many of you do not share your middle name? Raise it up high and wave it. I can't see everybody, okay? How many of you do share your middle name? We got one gentleman in the crowd, and I, I should have known it would have been Humphreys. Humphreys, what is your middle name? Rex. Rex. Yes. I remember that now. We, we all normally don't share that, right? That's, that's part of the, the, the part that we, we don't share. And I want you in just a minute, I'm going to ask you the question, and who are you? I want you to state your full name with your middle name, right? And don't hide your middle name. I want you to say it loud and proud when you get to the middle name, all right? So when we get there, I want you to share your full name. I'm going to ask you the simple question, and who are you? Are you ready? Here we go. And who are you? Okay. Now, I want you to look around at someone you don't know. Find someone you don't know in the crowd. Everybody's got to find someone you don't know. Maybe I may I contact with them. And if they were to ask the question, and who are you, I want you to, uh, when I say, and who are you, I want you to say, who, me? And I'm going to say, yes, you. And then I want you to tell that person your name. Are you ready? And who are you? Who, me? Right? I, I added too much. I already complicated it too much. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to say, and who are you? And you're going to say, who, me? And I'm going to say, yes, you. Then you state your whole name to the person you think doesn't know you. Are you ready? There's two over there. All right, and who are you? Who, me? Yes, you. You still don't know your name. Hey, Becky, thank you for stepping out in faith. That was perfect. She went over and found someone and introduced herself. Uh, many people don't know, my name is Matthew Todd Horsting Burns. Now, how Horstings and Hayslips ended up in the same family with lambs, I don't know, but we did, right? Um, Horsting is my biological name, and it was added to my name because I wanted it to be there for the family tree so they could find who was actually behind me and where all that went to. You know, it's very important that we realize today that yes, you and yes, me, God is wanting to fulfill his purpose through you. Not only does God have a lot of things in our life that are very similar, when we would study the scripture about the will of God for a man's life, the role of a man in the home, the role of a man in a church, if we would study in the scripture the, the role of a, a lady and the role of, of what a, a powerful lady is. We even talked about that on Mother's Day, some of the powerful ladies in the Word of God, what, what God's purpose was and what he did in their lives. There's a lot of things that would be general and the same, but there would be a lot of things that are very detailed and on purpose. And I want us to realize this morning as we start with Joshua chapter 2 that today as we look at Rahab's story, who God would use in a great way, even though... Uh, no one would really see it coming. This story will describe God using the faith and love of someone who seemed to be unlikely to help God's people. No one would ever guess that Rahab and her family would be someone who would help God's people. You see, a lot of times we um, don't realize all that God is doing. Everybody say, all that God is doing. We just see a tiny little part and we seem to sometimes over-focus on this little bitty thing and we don't see all that God is doing in the lives of those, not only of our own family, but those around us. I want us to see in Joshua chapter 2 as we jump into the story. Everybody say, get into the story. I hope that every day of your life you get into the story. You don't just read the scripture and kind of make a few marks and things like that. I want you to put yourself in the story. I want you to get into the story this morning. Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1. I want you to notice just a few little phrases as we get started. We see that Joshua is here going to send out two spies, and he says to them, go view the land, even Jericho. There's actually two things that they're to, to look at, not only Jericho, but he says, go view the land, not just Jericho only, but especially Jericho. First thing I want you to see is that careful preparation shows faithfulness, not the lack of faith. I want you to realize that Joshua here is taking careful preparation 
And he's showing, okay, we need to go into the land. We need to spy the land. I'm going to send two men to go do that. We need to go do this. So his careful preparation shows his faithful not, faithfulness, not his lack of faithfulness. I want us to realize that we all need to be faithful. Can you say amen? We all need to be faithful. We all need to be asking God, Lord, what is the preparation I need to make so that I can be faithful? God's promises of success to us, they should, not, should never bring us to a place of inaction. So you've been given a promise. Everybody say, I've got a promise. And many of those things could be reflected in the song that we heard this morning by Caleb. The things that we would name that God has been good are a lot of the promises that we have, such as the promise of heaven. Is that a good one? The promise of forgiveness. Is that a good one? What about the promise of mercy? Is that a good one? What about the promise of hope? What about the promise of mercy and love and joy? And the list goes on and on of things that we could claim. And and obviously we do need to claim and God asks us to claim, claim, but God's promises of success or of his promises don't need to bring us to a place of inaction. I want us to realize in order for you, yes, you and yes, me, in order for us to fulfill his purpose in our life, we have to be claiming his promises, but not sitting on those promises, but doing something with those promises. So we don't know really who these two spies are. They're not named in the scripture. Some speculation, some people would say that it was faithful Caleb, right? Joshua was with Caleb and all those steps. You remember all those? Joshua and Caleb together. Some would say maybe it was the high priest Eliezer. But there's some, some, uh, some notes in, in chapter 6 that reveal that they were young men. So I don't know if it was actually Caleb or, or uh, Eliezer or not, but... What I want us to see is that in Joshua chapter 1, verse 11, don't forget when we're in the story, we've got to remember what happened just the last chapter, and that is that Joshua told the people that they needed to get their food together and they need to wait at the Jordan. How many of you just love to wait? Anybody? You just love to wait. We don't love to wait. It's a very difficult thing to do, but then when it's time to go, it's time to go. Because we have just shared just weeks ago about crossing the Jordan. But here we're looking at this step of waiting. And I want you to see the step of being faithful. I want you to see the step of God's promises. I want us to realize that God has a special purpose for these three days. These three days that the children of Israel are at the Jordan, there's, there's something that's happening even though they can't see it. Everybody say they can't see it. The children of Israel at Jordan, they can't see what's happening because the spies have been sent secretly. They don't know what's happening in there. I wonder, they're probably questioning the leadership. What's going on, Joshua? Why are we just sitting around? Is there a reason we're just sitting around? Aren't we supposed to be crossing this Jordan? Maybe some of them were scared and didn't want to cross the Jordan. They were enjoying the waiting. Everyone was probably different. But I want us to see that the spies went secretly. And this shows some real wisdom on Joshua's part. Do you remember what happened last time that they sent spies publicly? Does anybody remember? Ten came back with a discouraging report. Do you remember it? Whereas as grasshoppers in the sight of giants, there's no way we can be going into this land that God wants us to go in. There's no way that we could do this, the discouraging report of Numbers chapter 13. So Joshua shows real wisdom in sending these spies. Then we notice this phrase, Go view the land, even Jericho. God has greater things in mind than what we can see. God has greater things in mind than what you and I can see. He sent the spies there, and he sent them for a reason. And it almost will seem at the end of the story that the battle, or the reason why they went was to help with the battle plan. And it doesn't even seem like that is even... Part of the help, like that doesn't even help. The spies going and coming back, how did that really help us with the battle plan? But God really has a purpose. Many times we can't see the purpose. Can you say, I can't see the purpose? Because a lot of times we're going to say, I can't see the purpose. And God is saying to us this morning as we follow this story that the spies are now getting ready to enter into Rahab's house and they... And they went and came into the harlot's house, verse 1, named Rahab. And it also mentions that they lodged there. Could you imagine what would happen if Facebook was around in these days? I mean, just get into the story for a minute. 
Could you imagine the, 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 the things that would be said about these two spies sent, with, sent from Joshua and they're at the Rahab's house and they're lodging there? Everybody go, hmm. A lot of people would be thinking a lot of things that they shouldn't be thinking because God's doing something they can't see. And there's a purpose going on here. And we're going to see the character of these two spies are in check and they're not in a place of questioning, but I can only imagine what people would have said in the day of the Old Testament faith, Facebook. They came into the harlot's house named Rahab. And a lot of uh, historians and a lot of uh, uh, Bible interpreters would say, well, uh, they, she was the innkeeper or things like this, but that is not the fact. That the, the, the language clearly is that she was a harlot. But I want to ask us, before we judge her too quick, this question. Do we know why she chose to be a harlot? Everybody go, hmm. Yeah, get into the story. Why did she choose to be a harlot? We don't know the answer to that question. We don't have the fact of the, the actual truth of that question, but I can only imagine that it's very possible because of the, this is a wicked place. This is a wicked nation here. I can only imagine that possibly in her family, maybe she was the oldest. Maybe her father chose to sold, sell her to be a prostitute to pay and help the family. Remember, this is a wicked nation. Everybody say wicked nation. There's a lot of junk going on here, right? And there's a lot of trash going on in this, this nation, this nation that is there in Jericho. And I can only imagine if we really knew the reason why she chose to be a harlot. We shouldn't be so quick to judge not only the spies, but the harlot herself. You know, it's really special when someone understands the need to receive Jesus. It's really special when they realize that um, they take ownership of their imperfect life. It's really scary when we as believers forget what we're capable of without Jesus. Did you hear what I said? It's bad when we forget what we're capable of without Jesus. Can you say, oh my? Oh my. Without Jesus. It's wonderful when the gospel is realized that it is for those who know that they're not perfect. The gospel is for those who know they're not perfect. You and I were in those shoes and we realized that day. Remember that day? When you put it all together and you're like, okay, I'm not perfect. Jesus was perfect. He went to the cross. He took the innocent death that I should have paid to even uh, try to be somewhat good, but he took it for all of us. And, and because of that, he rose from the dead and I can be saved today. Yes, that's true. You can be saved today. You can be delivered today. I want us to see a simple command that Matthew 7, 1 reveals. And Jesus said basically two words, don't judge. Judge not that you be not judged, he said in Matthew 7, 1. And it says there that, he, that they lodged there. Why did they go to the harlot's house? Can you ask the question? Could you answer the question if you were the spy? Why would you go to the harlot's house? When you really process this whole generation in this place called Jericho, you'd have to admit that this is probably a pretty perfect place to hide out. Would you agree with me? It probably could be a place to hide out if you knew the culture, if you knew where it was to remain anonymous and to kind of hide and blend in, this was a perfect place to hide. This was by no accident that God had them at Rahab's house. See, God was doing something that no one else could see. There was a purpose happening that no one else could understand. I love how that there is no hint of immorality with Rahab and these men because their testimony is important. But her story is important as well. See here in verses 2 through 7, I want you to take a glance at this. It says, and it was told the king of Jericho saying, hey, there's some men here. There's some men here and they're, they're here to spy. In verse 3 it says, and the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab saying, bring forth the men that came into thee, which have entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. They're here to spy and to see how to attack us. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, 
there, there came men unto me, but I was not where they were. I don't know where they went. I don't, I don't know. People came to me and asked me where, where you were, but I said I didn't know. And it came to pass at that time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whether the men went, I don't know. I, I don't really know. I woke not, as the, the scripture says. Pursue after them quickly, and you'll overtake them. Hurry up, guys. Get out there. They just left. I know it's getting dark, but I think you can catch them. So you're kind of pointing them in the wrong direction. The men that were there to find the spies, as we're, as we're talking about, verse 6. But it says, but she had brought them up to the roof of the house. I love that it's totally visible to God. I love the fact that they're taken up, and it says, and she hides them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. In verse 7, it says, and the men pursued after them, and went the way of the Jordan with a Chevy unto the, unto the fords. Did you see that? And it says, as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. Obviously, she pointed him in the wrong direction to protect these two men. She hides them in the flax or the, the, the roof covering that was natural for that day. She covers them up. I want us to see a couple different phrases here. Rahab took the two men and she hid them. In her culture, I want us to realize that uh, the, the tradition or the strong tradition of hospitality. Can you say hospitality? Man, don't you love it when someone gives you something good to eat? Don't you enjoy that? You didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to prepare it. They just give it to you, and boy, that hospitality tastes good. But this is something else I want you to see, that Rahab still had this same mindset of her tradition, of her country, but she took it a step further. Not only would she have the duty to protect and take care of these men because they were in her house, she actually, Rahab, shows great courage by putting her life on the line. Do you realize what she really did? She put her life on the line. On the line. Her life actually could be taken now by her, by her nation. Because she protected these two men. She put her life on the line. She took great courage. And don't you love it when someone shows courage? Can you say amen? So Rahab shows great courage considering her nation, considering her culture that has been given over to the worship of false gods and, immor and immorality. She has no previous contact with the word of God or the things of God, but I want you to notice God's doing something that we can't see. In verse 9 through 14, notice what she says. She says unto the men, what's the next two words? She says, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land is faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea from you. Now, now, just get into the story a little bit. How long ago did that happen? How long did that happen? How long ago did that happen? Do I need to move this up, Kev? How long ago did this happen? How many years ago? 40 years ago. She said, I heard about this. She says, and what they did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan, Shihon and Og, who ye utterly destroyed, Keep following the story, and as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did they remain any more courage in any man. I love that she showed courage herself just moments ago. It says, because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now, therefore, I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give them true token, and give, and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and my mother, and she doesn't miss anybody, and my brethren and my sister, and then she says, and all that they have, and deliver, deliver our, our lives from death. And the men answered her, what's the next four words? Our lives for yours. Because what you have done for us, we will return that blessing upon you. For ye utter not this our business. If you keep this where it needs to be, if you'll keep this, um, this covenant that we've made and you will not um, go against it, and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. A couple things I want us to see. I know that the Lord hath given you the land. 
This sudden outburst, right? An outburst of faith showing that God had a purpose in bringing Rahab and the spies together. Don't you love it when you see someone trust Christ and they, they just believe and they step out in faith? Do you love that? Say amen. When you see someone trust Christ and they, they say, I want to be a, a believer, but I, you know what I love? I love seeing people that are believers use their faith. An outburst of faith. I'm going to pick on my sister-in-law. She did, I didn't know she was going to go across the aisle. She took that challenge for real, and she went over and goes, I'm going to talk, tell this person who I am. And she goes over there and says, hey, I'm Rebecca Leanne Hayslip. Don't you love when someone has an outburst of faith? Say amen. We need to have that outburst of faith and see that God is doing a work. This is the same kind of thing that we enjoy when we see people trust Christ. I love how she says he is God in heaven and God on earth. Rahab, uh, you could say her declaration, right, was proof of her faith. I want us to see, you may remember these verses in Hebrews chapter 11. Listen to me. She's the only second lady mentioned in all of those few that were mentioned in the hall of faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God or to please him. You know that verse, right? Can you say that phrase with me? For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Can you say that with me? For without faith, it is impossible to please God. It goes on to say, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. If you're going to come to God today for salvation, if you're going to take that step, believe that he is who he says he is. Believe that he is the king of kings. Believe that he is the savior of the world on the cross. It says, and he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I want you to see this. And it says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell in verse 30. How did the walls of Jericho fall, people? I can't hear you, church. Church, I still can't hear you. By faith, the walls fell. What personally in your life do you need to see God take down some walls? What is something that he needs to reveal to you? What are you praying about? What are you asking God? What are you seeking God about? What are you knocking as we talked about in our Bible study on Wednesday to ask, seek, and to knock? in our relationship, and our prayer life with him. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. And verse 31 says, And by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Notice also in James chapter 2, if you want to turn, turn there, verse 24, 25, and 26 says, You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. See, our works are, are representative of our faith. It says, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by her works and by her faith, basically, it's saying. Both of those go together. When she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way, she pointed them in the, the direction away from those that would seek after her to destroy, to destroy them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Can I ask you a really big question this morning? What works are happening in your life personally because of your faith? What works are happening in your life right now because of your faith? What steps and what works are you taking as a result of your faith? Is there evidence of your faith? Or is your faith fallen asleep? Rahab was not saved by her works, but by her faith. She knew who God was. She knew who she was, and she trusted. She trusted God for her very life. She had fear of God. She showed her reverence. She had faith, faith in God. She had uh, the facts about God, so she declared her faith, and she also took steps in believing the facts about God. What step of faith am I on? Verse 12. Notice again the, the phrase there, looking at verse 12, that she also will show kindness to my father's house. Rahab's desire to save her family. Rahab's desire to save her family, to take a step of action, to rescue their lives. You see, the whole thing that we talked about, why did she choose 
to be a harlot? We don't know the answer to that, but her focus on her family, could she really have this desire? Obviously she does because she shows it here to save her family. Was she being a harlot only because her family needed her to be? What was the true reason? We don't have the fact of that, but we can truly see her love here for her family and her faith for her family. She says, swear a promise to me in verse 12. See, Rahab longed for assurance. Everybody say assurance. What step of assurance do you need in your faith right now? As you take, you say, okay, God, I see an arrow of of my personal life that you need me to go this way. I'm going to take a small step that direction. Can you keep giving me assurance I'm going the right direction with my faith? Not only does she want assurance by asking for a promise, you and I need the same thing in our life. In verses 15 through 21, we're going to see here the meaning of this, this scarlet cord. I want you to look at it with me. In verse 15, it says, then she, then she let them down by the cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. She actually sent them the opposite direction of where the pursuers went. And hide yourself there. How many days, church? Three days until the pursuers be returned. Remember, God has a purpose for these three days. And after, and afterward, may you go your way. In verse 17, and the men said unto her, we will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come to the land, thou shalt bind the line of scarlet of thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all that thy father's household home unto thee. Notice it says there in 19, it says basically that all those that are in your house will be safe. If anyone steps out, that's when they'll be at their own risk. And verse 20 says, If thou utter this our business, then will we be quit of thine oath. We'll be void of this oath, which thou hast made us to swear. In verse 21, and she said, According to thy words, so be it. I love how she says this here. According to your words, so be it. And she went or she sent them away and then departed and she bound the scarlet line in the window. I want you to see a couple things here. That she took the scarlet and she bound it immediately in her window. This, win- this window was <clears throat> not only probably in her day, most likely was already had a piece of scarlet in it because of her being a harlot, but this is another piece of scarlet that's supposed to represent something different because seeing Josh, Joshua in the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus. And Jesus is, is being the representative of this scarlet thread here. In just a moment, you'll see, as we look at it, it says the this, this single, this single thread of, of, of scarlet or this rope or this, and actually made out of the same thing that the, that the flax was made of out of the roof was taken, and it was probably not very small. It was probably pretty big because obviously and had to hold the weight of these men to go down the, out of the city. And this was to be a signal to the army of Israel that the people in this house should be spared. So think about this for a minute. Despite Rahab's desire, despite her faith, despite the promises that the two spies gave, if she would not have put this scarlet thread or this scarlet rope in the window, she would not have survived. It was her step to immediately take that and to hang it in that window. Without it, she would have perished. Without this blood red cord hanging from her window, she would not have the symbol or the signal of Jesus' blood on her window. Remember the day of Pentecost, right? 40 years before as they left Egypt, right? The day of Passover, the innocent lamb was to be sacrificed. Do you remember that, church? And the blood was to be applied to the window. So basically, or to the door, the, the, the blood is basically being applied to this window. So without this scarlet cord, she could not have been saved. I love how she did it immediately. She didn't wait. See, Rahab immediately did this, putting her faith in both the identification but the, and the safety of the scarlet cord, representing Jesus and God himself. She trusted the two spies who made the promises about the scarlet cord 
I'm going to ask us this question, who do you trust? Do you trust what God is saying to you? Do you trust the people that God is putting into your life? Who do you trust? But then I ask us this question this morning, who do you judge? Have you found your place in your heart that you're judging someone or, or putting some assumptions on someone? God doesn't want us to judge one another. He wants us to trust one another. I want us to notice that Joshua would be the savior of Rahab, but he would be a judge to the rest of Jericho. Jesus is the savior for those who trust him and the judge for those who reject him. She said, according to your words, so be it. See, Rahab's destiny, listen to me. Rahab's destiny was to marry one of the princes of Judah. Say, I can't see it. You're not talking to me. I can't see it. See, we can't see the purpose of why Rahab's house was to be saved. We don't see the purpose of Rahab's desire to be saved. But now, later, we see Rahab's destiny and her purpose was to marry one of the princes of Judah and be found in the lineage of King David himself, the great-great-grandmother of King David. But that's not what's so important. She was to be in the lineage of Jesus himself. So you may not be able to see the purpose. You may be tempted to judge, but I encourage you this morning to trust the right people. When God speaks to us, we should say, according to thy word, so be it. God, fulfill your purpose. These last couple of verses. Verse 22. They went to the mountain as she had suggested. They stayed those three days. They returned to the people of God. It says in verse 23, they descended from the mountain and came to Joshua in verse 24, and it says, And Joshua said, Why did you go to the harlot's house? Is that what your Bible says? I can't hear you, church. No, it does not say that. It says, And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land. Look at me, church. See, Jericho was just the beginning. Jericho, the city of Jericho, when it would be conquered, if you looked at that land, it opened up all the other lands. This was a major, major step in the battle, a major step of faith, a major step of love, a major step of trust, a major step of them following the mission and vision that God had asked them to do, and they couldn't see it all. I can't see it all. You can't see it all. But what step of faith what step of love, what step of trust is God asking from you? I can imagine as they talked and had this conversation, we see the end of the conversation, obviously, but considering how God would conquer the city of Jericho is not discussed in this meeting. Because in chapter 6, that's going to be revealed to Joshua. How did this information even help them in the battle plan of Jericho? You could say it really didn't help at all because when you look at Jericho, Jericho was one of the most fortified cities of Canaan. Two walls around it. More evidence has been revealed of this in the past years. This was a major fortified city. Like I said, it opened up the rest of the cities beyond it and the, and the nations beyond it. And if Israel could conquer this land, it would open up all that God had for them. I don't know what's in front of you that God wants to conquer, but there's a whole lot ahead of that. I don't know what's in front of you that you need to use love for or faith for or trust for, but when you do that and when you use it, God's going to open up a whole lot more to you. God's going to give you and show to you things you didn't see before, and because of your trust and because of your willingness to see, you can't see it all. So how did this mission of the two spies really help the current battle? It's found in verse 24, where it says, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land. Did it say Jericho? It did not. It said all the land. They knew that they could see beyond Jericho. 
For even or indeed the inhabitants of the country are faint or faint-hearted because of us. Because of you, God, I know what? If you were to fill in the blank, because of you, God, I know what? What could you say this morning, God? Because of you, I know I can be saved. Because of you, I know you're going to take care of this. Whatever that is. Because of you, God. Truly, the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land. The spies, the mission. This mission didn't seem like it really helped the military strategy, but it did help the encouraging, the faith of those two spies and the whole nation of Israel. Tell the person next to you, I want to encourage you. And this is what I want you to say. Truly the Lord has delivered into your hands all the land. You can't see it, but it's still going to take a step of faith here in just a moment. You see, this encouragement was more important than a battle plan. You see, when we have a judgmental mentality, it hinders us from trusting in the truth. Did you hear me? A judgmental mentality hinders us from trusting the truth. Judging others causes us to distrust others. Someone said to me this week when we were talking about just reaching the world for Christ, this young man said to me, we cannot reach them if we are judging them when we should be loving them. Who in your world would be someone without knowledge of Christ? Who is someone that you need to stop judging and start loving? See, increasing our faith and increasing our love and increasing our trust is what the mission and vision is for today. The mission and vision is not to get a few people saved at Hillsboro Bible Baptist Church. That is not the mission. The mission is to reach the entire world. Can you say amen? amen? The disciples believed that they could reach the entire world. Can we do it tomorrow? No, not tomorrow we can't. But in time we can. I want us to see, and I, I know I'm taking your time this morning. Joshua chapter 6, please turn there. In verse 15. I want us to see a few things as we finish. And it came to pass on the seventh day. This is when they're actually conquering Jericho, and a lot of you know the story. If you don't, I encourage you to read the story. It's quite unique of what God did. So on the seventh day, they rose up early about the dawning of the day. How many of you enjoy a sunrise? I can only imagine Joshua getting up that morning, all the people getting up that morning on the seventh day, that Jericho, that they would see the walls fall. Could you imagine that sunrise? Knowing that the last six days they had walked around Jericho one time, and it's a miracle in itself that they could do that without talking, but they walked the city one time for six days, and now the seventh day they're going to walk around seven times. It says, and they compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times, and it came to pass on the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. I want us to skip down and see a couple more verses, verse 22 and 23. And Joshua had said unto the two men, that had spied out the country. I can just imagine this moment. The walls have fallen. <laughs> Joshua says to the two young men, it says in just a moment, I want you guys to go to Rahab's house and ask them to come out. Could you imagine having that experience at Rahab's house and her protecting you, and now the scarlet cord is in the window, and her house has been spared, and Joshua doesn't go, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to say hello to everybody. He says, you two boys, 
Go in there and get Rahab's family. I want you to see what God has done that you could not see. I want you to see what God did through you. And it says, And the, and the young men that were spied went in and brought out Rahab. And it doesn't mention, doesn't miss anybody. Her father, her mother, her brethren, and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred. A couple verses down, it says, And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelleth, everybody say dwelleth. She dwelleth in Israel, even unto this day. She's the great, great grandmother of King David. And the lineage of Jesus himself. Because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out the land. In the last verse 27, so the Lord was with Joshua, or you could say the Lord was with his people. I want to ask you today to find encouragement. And I'm also going to ask you today to be encouragement. Three ways that you can be an encouragement is to use your faith, to use your love, and to use your trust. I want us to look around us and be aware God is at work. Can you say God is at work? God is at work in ways you cannot see. And who are you again? Can you tell me your full name one more time? One more time, please. Yes, you. God is using you to fulfill his purpose. Will you use your faith? Will you use your love? Will you use your trust? It's going to take faith. It's going to take love. It's going to take trust. Could you imagine that scarlet cord, that scarlet rope made out of flax hanging from that window? Could you imagine the harlot curtain also being there? It almost shows you the form of a cross. Has your house been marked with the cross? Has your internal soul been marked with the cross? Because if you don't have Jesus, if you don't have the scarlet cord in your heart today, God will be your judge. But God desires to be what, church? Your Savior. Today, make Jesus your Savior. Trust in the scarlet blood that ran from the cross for you. Don't forget, church, listen to me. Don't forget what you're capable of without Jesus. We all have a way to forget that. And I believe it's the, the attack of Satan on the believer to say, you're pretty good. You're a pretty good guy. You're a pretty good girl. You should just enjoy the promises of God. Why use your faith? Why use your love? Why use your trust? You're just fine right where you're sitting. But God doesn't want you to sit there. He wants you to take your faith, your love and trust, and put it in action. So today, not only today, but this week, God wants to fulfill his purpose in you. He wants to fulfill his purpose in me. He wants to fulfill his purpose in my house. But I tell you today, if he's not in your house, if you've not received him today, don't let it pass by. Apply the blood to your heart. You say, man, how do I do that? You simply come and let someone show you in the scripture that you need to trust him with your mouth and with your heart. See, if you're doubting that today, don't doubt it any longer. If you're doubting the leadership of Joshua, Caleb, or any of those men, use your trust today. God is at work here, church. Can you say amen? God is at work here, not only here, but tonight I can't wait to hear Randy Ashcraft and what God is doing in their lives. God is at work and he's doing things you can't see. So trust him. 
Trust who He has put in your life as leaders. Trust in the blood of Jesus for the repentance of your, or the remission of your sins by repentance. Would you bow and pray with me today? The instrument will play in just a moment, but if you're a believer today, God said something to you today. Would you step out in faith? Would you step out in love? Would you step out in trust? Would you come to Him today as, as, his, as his people? And say, God, there's a lot of things I can't see, but God, I know you're working and I'm going to trust what you're doing. I'm going to trust in your purpose for my life today. And just like those spies came to Rahab, I know that there's someone that needs Jesus in my life that you're going to take me to. And God, I want to be that person that reaches them. I want to be that person that brings Jesus to their house. Church, would you respond by coming this morning? That's my first invitation in God's house at His altar. But my second thought is for those that don't have Jesus in their hearts and lives today. If you don't know for sure in your heart that you've deliberately asked Him to be your Savior, why leave today? in doubt and fear of facing God as a judge instead of facing Him as a Savior? If you say, Matt, right now, I don't know that for sure I'm saved. I'm, I'm having doubts about whether I'm going to be in heaven someday, whether I understand what Jesus did. And i got questions. And I, I really would like to have answers to my questions. If, if that's you this morning, would you just simply lift up a hand and say, Matt, I've got questions. Would you just share that by lifting up your hand this morning? Matt, I've got questions. Will you pray that I get those answers to my questions? Would you just simply slip up your hand and say, Matt, pray for me today? I'm looking on my left-hand side. Someone on my left, if you say, Matt, today I've got doubts about my salvation. I've got doubts about eternity. Just pray for me. I get answers to those questions. Would you just slip your hand up? And now to my right, if you say, Matt, today I've got doubts. I don't, I've don't, never made Jesus... The Lord of my life, you say, Matt, pray for me. Anybody like that? Say, Matt, pray for me. All right, my next question is for the church family. If you would say, Matt, I know in my heart that faith is not active like it should be. I know that my love is not active as it should be. And I know that my trust is not active like it should be. And maybe even... You've started to judge one another. You say, God, I want you to remove my judge mental mentality so that I can love and have faith and have trust. If you say, Matt, in one of those areas, God spoke to me today, would you just slip your hand up? Say, Matt, that's me. Just slip it up. Say, Matt, that's me. Please slip it up. Say, Matt, that's me. I know I need to work on one of those areas. Say, Matt, I need to trust more. I need to love more. I need to have more faith. Say, Matt, I need to stop judging. I found this mentality of judgment in my heart and I need it to be taken away. Anyone else that would join these and raise your hand? Lord, pray pray for me today that I would use my faith, my love, my trust. Would you slip it up? Lord, as we bring this invitation to you, God, we know this is a house of prayer. God, I thank you for our assembly early this morning as we prayed for today and we prayed for our week and we prayed for your purpose to be to be fulfilled. I pray, Lord, today that you'd remove from us the judgmental heart, that you would give us a heart of faith, a heart of love, and a heart of trust, that, God, that we will realize we can't see all that you're doing. So, Lord, I pray that today you would be with your battle plan. God, that you would be with just as we saw this morning, you sharing that battle plan with Joshua and Joshua taking that next step of faith for his own walk with you to march around the city once a day and then that last day, seven days, and that shout. Could you imagine, Lord, to hear that shout and the walls to come down? Lord, remove the walls 
today that need to come down. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to respond and not only worship, but in prayer. Lord, I pray that we would, as a church, use the altar you've given to us, that God, once we stand before you, we'll be pleased with our response and our walk with you. So we love you, we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we worship, as we pray. You come this morning, don't hesitate. Time, will you do that for me? Just sing it out. I trust in God. I can't hear you, church. Come on. The one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God. My Savior, the one. said unto Joshua, truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land. I want to encourage you to meditate on that verse this week and to memorize that verse. That would be Joshua 2, 24. I don't know what land is ahead of you, but God's got it taken care of. You believe that? Say amen. A couple of reminders today for you, our safety team and our security team. Uh, they're going to be meeting in the chapel right after the service. In fact, I probably need to go ahead and Uh, excuse you if you're on those teams if you'd make your way to the chapel uh, they'll be meeting there to uh, work on the next schedule and share a few thoughts with you so uh, wonderful team thank you guys for what you do Uh, tonight as we mentioned five o'clock family service tonight we're going to enjoy our missionary randy ashcraft hearing what god is doing and the world's mission with him He's a wonderful missionary who supported uh, for over 20 years. What a great man of God. And so we're looking forward to hearing his report and his encouragement tonight. Uh, I want to also say our our church uh, helps with the camps in the summer, $50 per student. And so we want to be able to help them. You can see the code there in the bulletin. Go ahead and get those uh, students registered. And then we're also looking for uh, sponsors. If you'd like to sponsor again this year, you can do a partial sponsor. If the Lord just lays that on your heart. Uh, I know for Stace and I, we're talking about what God would have us do there. So pray about it. I don't know what it would be, uh, but there's a lot of students that uh, could use the encouragement of that camp. And, and so be able to help us with that. And then uh, also this morning, as, as you know, uh, as we receive the offerings in the mornings, we do that at the back tables on your way out. Um, if you were a, a guest with us today, thank you for being here. I want to be able to get a chance to, to visit with you. I'll be out at the main lobby in the, in the welcome center there. So stop by, give me a chance to get to talk to you. But if you uh, would give us a contact name through the QR code there on the back of the seat, or there's a, also a gift for you at the welcome center, uh, we can get your info there. Just want to stay in touch with you and encourage you. And then this morning, as we pray for the offering of what uh, God would use our finances to uh, reach our community, to care, take care of his house. How many of you glad you can give? Say amen. amen. I'm glad we can give. God has blessed us and allowed us to uh, be a part of his work. And so thank you for your giving as we uh, pray for that and as we ask God to uh, 
to bless the offering this morning and to bless our, our work this morning. Remember, God's got a purpose for you, right? Don't forget that God is fulfilling his purpose through you. And so go out this week and enjoy the week God has planned for you, even though it may have a battle in it, even though it may have something to conquer in it, you might see some walls fall this week, right? So go into your week expecting and using your faith, your love, and your trust, and using your heart not to judge others, but to let your heart love them and show them Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the morning. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for the scarlet cord that hung from the cross. Thank you for the scarlet cord that hung from Rahab's window. And thank you for the blood that was applied in Egypt on that Passover day. Thank you, Lord, for that seventh day when they marched around those walls of Jericho as those walls came down. God, that those two men went in and saw the evidence of love, the evidence of faith. They saw the evidence of, Lord, your life and your heart doing a work. So we know we can't see it all, but God, we know that you can. So we trust you. We love you. We thank you for this day. Bless now, we pray this week, fulfill your purpose in our lives. In Jesus' holy name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Guilty and getting out of